few months ago, I returned home after a, a day of teaching maths and I decided to relax in the best way that I know how, by doing more maths problems. And it was something that my students find very difficult to comprehend. Why would I choose to spend more of my time, my free time, doing maths problems? It's an easy thing for me to see because I can see the beauty in the subject. I can recognize the opportunities that it gives me for truly creative thought. But it's hard work convincing teenagers of this. What I didn't realize is that the problem I was going to look at on that particular evening was one that would stay with me for so many months. It's a problem that is still whirring around in my mind now. The problem that I, that I stu uh, stumbled across was one from this website. If you're not familiar with Numberphile, I strongly encourage you, any students we have amongst us, you have to go and explore the videos of Numberphile. This particular video introduced a concept called multiplicative persistence. Maybe I'm not selling it very well there with the title, okay? But it's a very simple idea. You take a very large number, multiply all of its digits together, and it will give you a new, very large number. You multiply all of its digits together, and you repeat that process. And eventually, you'll end up down to a single digit. Okay, that's quite interesting. Now, the number of times that we repeat this process refers to the persistence of that number. So this number, we were able to do it 11 times. It has a persistence of 11. What we might not realize yet is you are looking at a world record number here. Nobody can beat this. You can do it later on if you want. You can do it now if you want. Please don't. <coughs> you could choose a number 100 digits in length. It still won't beat this number here. Math is weird like that. What's so special about this number? Seemingly random, although it's got a lot of sevens and eights in it, maybe that's important. It poses so many of these questions. But I'm not here to talk to you about this maths problem. What I'm here to talk to you about is the train of thought that this began, in my mind. Because actually in this video you will see the way that this number was found. It was found using a computer program. It's not like I've been living under a rock and had no idea that computer programming existed. I knew that maths can be solved using coding, but I'd never actually seen it before. I'd never seen the fact that you can have a problem that with my tools, algebra, I would have not been able to get there. But using computer programming, they very simply set forth how that would be done. Press run for the computer program, go to bed, wake up, it's in your inbox. The questions started whirring around in my mind. The problem I referred to at the start is not a mathematical one, it's an educational one. How do we deal with this? How do we prepare our students for the world that they're living in now? As a math teacher, how do I adapt my math teaching in order to encompass this? I began to research and I stumbled across this brilliant website. It's called Project Euler. It's a website designed for people that want to learn how to program by solving maths problems. And the first problem that was on there, one of about 600, was this one. Find the sum of all the multiples of three or five below 1,000. Now to give you some context, some of the students I teach would be able to solve this problem. My very able year 11 bunch would be able to solve this problem with a little bit of encouragement. But they would need a method to do that and they would need an efficient method to add together all the multiples of five, an efficient method to add together all the multiples of three, and they would need some mathematical insight to recognize if they're not careful, they're gonna accidentally count some numbers twice. And so with me having the tools to answer this problem, I did it in the way I know how, the old fashioned way with paper and pen. And I got my solution and I did it so that I could enter it into the website, which would then enable me to peer back behind the curtain and enter a forum where everybody else was sharing their methods. And their methods look very different to mine. I could see from the comments that these were school-age students that had done it. Some of them as young as 11. Some of them without the same mathematical ability as my year 11s. 
They could still solve that maths problem in a way that I couldn't. The questions continued in my mind. What do we do with this? I thought I'd chance it. I'd just ask the computer the question. This website, Wolfram Alpha, uses artificial intelligence to not to search for the answer to a maths question, but to compute it. I entered it in, and I'll be honest, I was nervous. I didn't know what it was going to return. Turns out it returned a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> but this uses machine learning, this website. So if I ask it the same question in six months' time, there's a very good chance it will know. In fact, if I ask it a question now, more difficult than this, Siri, can you solve sine x equals log x? Okay, Siri's done that. That's remarkable. But it's so scary as well. It's, it, it's something that excites me, but it also scares me. What do I do with that as a math teacher? How long is my job safe? <laughs> okay, so what is it that we're going to do about it? Because if we don't do anything, then we know that this question is only going to gain more persistence. This is the question my students already ask. It's the question students have asked for a very long time, before the invention of the smartphone, before the invention of the pocket calculator. Students ask this, but they're going to ask it a lot more when they can see maths problems solved in such a simple way. Take out the phone and ask it. The problem with an issue that's been around for so long is that we fail to recognize when it gains momentum. And this issue is going to gain momentum. So it's time we address this question. Why do we teach maths in the first place? Possibly a dangerous question for me to be asking as a math teacher. The answer is there's very many good reasons. The first of which seems really obvious, but we choose to teach mathematics so that we can develop a new generation of mathematicians. Why do we need mathematicians? Well, mathematicians spend all day working on problems, and in order to solve those problems, they create new areas of maths. Those new areas of maths that they create are picked up by physicists, chemists, electrical engineers, computer scientists, economists, you name it. And they find ways of applying it back to the real world. That's how innovation happens. So it's really important that our education serves those students that are going to go off and become mathematicians. But we're talking about the 1% here, maybe less. So why do we teach maths for everybody else? Again, we have good answers. The first of which, the th first thing always comes to my mind is the idea of number sense. If you've ever been overcharged before in a restaurant, that feeling that you get, I'm not talking about anger, a feeling that you get that you've been overcharged before you actually calculate how much you've been overcharged by, that's number sense. The feeling that this seems too high doesn't exist without number sense. We also have many other uh, things that we teach students that they need to get by in the real world. Basic statistics, basic percentages, you see them every day. We're in such a data-heavy environment now. Students need to understand this. They still need their basic operations. But what I would classify these things are as utility maths. This is maths that serves a specific purpose. We can recognize the importance of this. But let's take some topics I've been teaching more recently for my year 10s. Quadratic equations. Circle theorems. Why do we need to learn circle theorems? I could find applications and demonstrate to my students of specific cases where a circle theorem would solve a problem, but that's not why we choose to teach it. We choose to teach it because these topics provide us with a framework in order for us to develop something bigger, in order for us to develop, to develop mathematical thinking. Mathematical thinking gives us the ability to think sequentially. It gives us the ability to generalize a problem. It gives us the ability to think logically, to analyze, to develop accuracy, and all of these things give us the ability to problem solve. Everybody needs this. 
It's what we need to offer our students so that they can innovate. But if I stop a student in the corridor and I ask them, what is maths giving you? I don't feel like they're going to give me this answer. There's still so many students asking that question, why do we need this? They can't see the bigger picture behind it. We can't blame them for it. They're looking at the short-term goal. They're looking at their GCSE that's coming up. And they're looking at the questions that are on that GCSE. They're learning how to use a quadratic formula to solve a quadratic equation. And they can't see beyond that. It's our job as math teachers to try and help them to see it, but it is a difficult job. If we were doing things perfectly, courses like this one would not exist. Introduction to Mathematical Thinking. This is a course that is targeting post-16 students to do it alongside their maths education. Introduction to Mathematical Thinking. The implication being that the course instructor, Dr. Keith Devlin, feels that you can get to the age of 16 without ever really having to have thought mathematically. He felt the need to devise this course, and over 200,000 students have felt the need to take this course because they wanted to get out of it the ability to think like a mathematician. And it upsets me that this course needs to exist. Don't get me wrong, I think we're doing a really good job as teachers, but I think we could be doing so much better. Imagine how empowering that would be if our students went away feeling like they are thinking like mathematicians. So why don't we just change the way we teach? Just change it so that we teach it more like that course. Students will feel this way. It was a very obvious obstacle. The contents of a course, the sheer volume in which a teacher needs to get through, provides that obstacle. Why is there so much content on a course? Well, countries are all competing with one another. We have TIMS tests and PISA tests. Countries want to boost their international rankings, and so they force more content into the curriculum. It doesn't feel like a race to the top to me. It feels more like a race to mediocrity with that approach. Allow me to illustrate it with an example. The new GCSE spec has added iterative formulae onto its course. Iterative formulae, iteration just means to repeat a process. Iterative formulae, an example, would be the Fibonacci sequence, something we may be familiar with. If we're not, we can pick it up very quickly. Every term in this sequence is just the sum of the two terms that go before it. This is an iterative sequence. If we rearrange it geometrically, it forms this spiral. And this same spiral exists in all walks of nature. The same Fibonacci sequence can be used to model population growth. And iterative algorithms are an essential part of programming. Without iterative formulae, we wouldn't be able to create this beautiful self-repeating image. I could spend two weeks with a class, exploring and delving into all of these things, getting students to pose exciting questions and go and find them out for themselves. But the reality is, with the amount of content, it's we need to hurry that part and move on to this, and then go on to the next topic. Math teachers want to spend more time exploring and delving into these things. But there's the obstacle that's there. We do it in creative ways. We find creative ways of doing this, but the obstacle is the sheer volume of content. And so this is where we are now. This is where we need to be thinking. We need to be thinking technology is forcing our hand anyway, that we must be addressing the way that we teach maths. If that's the case, then the question becomes, which country is going to make the first move? Which country is going to dare to strip out some of the content that perhaps may not be as relevant to the 21st century? And which country is then going to provide math teachers with more opportunities to get our students to explore mathematically and to develop the ability to think like a mathematician? The country that chooses to do that is the one that will produce the greatest generation of innovators. Thank you.